What's up, everybody? I am here tonight talking about repentance. We are in a time, in a season, in a day and age where the love of many has grown cold. Um, there are many evil things that are being done, not just in the dark anymore, but also in the light. And it's amazing because Satan is literally speaking through his pawns. And so many believers are being deceived by their words. They're saying, oh, this is just the culture we live in now. This is the time. This is the generation. And there's no more morality. There's, there's no more honoring. There's, like I said, the love of many has grown cold. And tonight's message that I wanted to bring to each and every person to you is a message of repentance. Now, I know many of you may watch some of my videos, you may listen to these messages and you may go, Cameron is always talking about judgment. Cameron is always talking about repentance. Cameron is always talking about turning away or he brings up hell. And the reason I do is because I care more about your soul than I do your feelings. I care more about your soul than I do your physicality. I care more about where your soul will be for an eternity. Than where, than where your house will be for only a moment. Than how much money you will have for only a moment. Or the car you may drive for only a moment. So I talk about repentance. And I give these messages because God's word tells us to warn. Warn. Warn the people of the evil that they are doing. Of the wicked things that they do. Because if I see the evil that's going on, if I hear the evil that is spoken of and I don't speak up on it and I don't warn you, your blood is on my hands. This, is, this goes to any prophet, to any apostle, to any pastor, teacher, evangelist, anyone who is watching this video right now. If you do not warn, if you choose not to warn the body of Christ, if you choose not to warn the world, those who are lost, those who are sick, those who are cold hearted. If you choose not to warn them, even when you see them in their wickedness, the word says the blood is on your hands. So tonight's message is repentance. Tonight's message is to encourage you. To turn away from your sins and to repent now. Turn away now because time, guys, is going like this. Time is moving like we've never seen it move before. There's so much going on today and I know nothing is new under the sun. But the times that we are living in now is the times in which Jesus told us to prepare for the times we're living in now is the times in which Daniel spoke about, in which Ezekiel spoke of, and Isaiah spoke of. The prophets spoke of the times that we are currently in. And so many Christians are living lukewarm lifestyles and they're in a dangerous place. Their souls are in a dangerous place. God said, if you are even lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. He said, if you're in the lukewarm place, he will spit you out like vomit. And today I want to give this message to, to prevent you from going to that vomit. From going to the vomit in which God spits out. Now, we serve a graceful God. We serve a loving God. But we also serve a God who is full of wrath and who is full of judgment. And if you do not serve him, if you do not honor him, if you do not obey him, if you do not believe him, you are in great trouble and you will be in great trouble as the rest of the world. Tonight, I want to start off this message with a dream that I had on August 1st of 2022. So I'm sharing this video on August 2nd. But yes, last night, if you want to say on August 1st of this year, I had a dream and I'm just going to read. I had to write it down. I want to just read it to you all. The dream started off with news that there was a tornado that started off in Pennsylvania. It was the fasting moving, the fastest moving tornado to ever be recorded in our nation's history. Now, when I say fastest moving, I mean this tornado developed in Pennsylvania 
It touched down in Pennsylvania and it moved, I mean, across states at a record speed. I'm not just talking about the winds. I'm not just talking about its destruction. I'm talking about the tornado itself. It moved at record speeds. So this tornado moved across multiple states and it came to this expressway that looked like the expressway behind my wife and I's house here in Indiana. When it reached the expressway, I remember seeing the tornado rip through many cars. The winds accompanying the tornado were so powerful that nobody near the tornado was able to drive or run away. It was that powerful. The winds were that strong that anyone who was driving towards it, anyone who tried driving away from it, anyone who tried running away from it, they were all sucked in. It was so powerful. That anyone who tried to get away from it, they were all sucked into the tornado's vortex. After, tornado, after the tornado had caused much destruction, it disappeared. But it disappeared again at a record. Like one moment it was on the ground and I mean probably within two seconds it was back in the sky. It wasn't there. It was gone. Completely gone. I then woke up. But then I fell back asleep. When I fell back asleep, I saw all the destruction the tornado had left behind. But then I saw all of this water in the community and community surrounding. So where I live and just also the towns around the community, I was able to see things from like an aerial view. There was water in all of these communities. Now the water was very dark, darker than usual. And it had completely covered the roads and many homes had been destroyed. It looked as if a flash flood had happened, but there was much more water than most flash floods bring. And for those of you that know about the flash flooding in Kentucky, I want you to think about that. But the amount of water I saw was times 10. If you're thinking about the flash flood flooding that took place in Las Vegas or even in St. Louis, the amount of water that I saw in this dream, it was times 10, guys. It, it was nowhere near close to what we've seen on the news recently. But I remember seeing many people walking in the water, crying and searching for loved ones. Many were in despair and many were afraid. Again, I woke up and fell back asleep. When I fell back asleep, I remember seeing all of the water again. But this time there were three to four submarines in the water. I found it weird that there were submarines in the water because this was flooding that had taken place in residential neighborhoods, in communities, in some popular roads, but the majority of it was in residential neighborhoods. But the water had gotten so high or so deep and remember, I saw it sort of from an aerial view, so I, I couldn't tell you if the water had just gotten so high or if it was so deep, but you'll see what I mean here. It had gotten so high and so deep that submarines were able to maneuver their way through the water. As the submarines went by, I saw the tips of their heads poking out of the water with a speaker on top. And the leader and or captain of the first submarine, this was the submarine that was leading the other three, he was making an urgent announcement and he said, warning, warning, warning. Take cover now. Please take immediate cover. China is threatening to launch a nuke, meaning a nuclear warfare missile. China has threatened to launch a nuke. Please take immediate cover now. And that's how my dream ended. My dream ended just like that. And actually, on I'll share this with you. On June 22nd of this year, so June 22nd of 2022, I had another vision that Chinese soldiers were attacking public places. They were attacking shopping centers. They were attacking areas in which we as Americans normally gather in. They were attacking those places. Now, am I saying that there is going to, that we're going to see all these Chinese, um, that we're going to see Chinese militia invade the United States? 
Am I saying that we're going to see all hell break loose on all this warfare breakout in the United States? To be honest with you, with everything that's going on in the world right now, I can't give you a yes and I can't give you a no. But what I can give you from this dream is that you must repent. I shared that dream with you all to warn you, not to scare you, not to put fear in your heart. And if it is fear in your heart, I pray that it is healthy fear. And you may say, well, Cameron, what is healthy fear? That God convicts you and that he put that fear in your heart to bring you to him, to draw you to him. So that you will repent. Tonight, I'm going to share a few scriptures with you all. We'll break some down. We'll talk about some of the things that we see going on in the world today. But guys, I, I want to just stress over and over and over again. I can't stress it enough. Repent, repent, and repent. We are truly in the last days we are in the last days a lot of people now when you see everything that's going on i wouldn't believe if we're in the last hour there is so much going on in the world not just in the united states not just in canada not just in mexico not just in africa not in asia there is so much going on all around the globe and i'm i'm here to tell you that if you don't take heed to the words that I am about to say and to the words that I've already said, you will be drunk on the wine that God is going, that God's angels are going to pour on this earth. They're going to pour from God's cup. They're going to pour his wrath onto the earth. And there will be so many who are of this world, both who call themselves Christians and both who call themselves atheists or agnostics. There's going to be so many who are going to be drunk off that wine. When they see everything taking place, it'll be too late. So the first scripture that I want to share with you all tonight. The first scripture here is warn is Ezekiel chapter 3 verses 18. Again, it is Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18. And this particular scripture talks about warning the people. And for those of us who, who God has called, who God has chosen, who God has anointed, this first point is to all pastors, to all teachers, to all apostles, to all evangelists, to all prophets. If you are any part of the fivefold ministry, Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18 tells us that we should be warning the people. Because if you don't, the blood will be on your hands. The blood will be on your hands. Remember when Pilate had Jesus on trial. Now he had the power. He had the authority to say that he doesn't find this man, that he didn't find Jesus guilty. Get him out of my sight. We want nothing else to do with him. But because Pilate was trying to please the culture. As we see many leaders, many who are part of the fivefold ministry, they try to please the culture. They want to be friends with the world. And I'm going to go. My next scripture is going to be about that. They want to be friends with the world. But if you want to be so attached to culture, if you're worried about culture judging you, if you are worried about man talking about you, if you're worried about man wanting nothing to do with you. Their blood will be on your hands because you knew better and you didn't warn them. You didn't teach them. You didn't tell them. Ezekiel chapter three, verse 18 says, if I warn the wicked saying you are under the penalty of death, but you fail to deliver the warning, they will die in their sins. Now, this is God speaking to Ezekiel. And I will hold you responsible for their deaths. If you warn them and they refuse to repent and keep on sinning, they will die in their sins. But you will have saved yourself 
because you have obeyed me. Has God given you? And again, I'm talking to the fivefold ministry right now. And even if you're not part of the fivefold ministry, you may be a student in college. You may be someone in the workplace. You may see all the evil that is going on. And God has given you a warning. He's put it so heavy on your heart to warn your coworkers, to warn your friends, to warn your students, maybe even to warn your teacher. Have you been disobedient because you're afraid as to what people will think of you? Do you know that if God told you to warn a group of people or maybe to warn one person and you did it out of fear, you did it because you you didn't do it because you you were afraid, you were so consumed in your image. If that person or those individuals, that group in which he told you to warn, if they died today, if they died right now, their blood would be on your hands. You may say, oh my gosh, they're in hell. There was, I, I could have done more, I could have said more. We see all these posts, we see Facebook posts, we see Instagram, we see celebrities. We see everybody, every person that dies, we see it every day. Rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace. But the truth of the matter is many are not resting and many are not in peace. The truth of the matter is many are lacking rest because they are now facing torment for an eternity. Now you may say, Cameron, why are you yelling? Cameron, why are you being so aggressive? Cameron, why are you delivering this harsh message? Because I care about your soul. Because I know, just as you may know, and some of you watching this may not know, hell is real. There's a place, there's an evil, dark place that is absent from God. There's an evil, dark, dark place. Where God is not, his presence is not there. There is no peace. There is no light. There is no air. So it's hard for you to breathe. There's a place beneath the earth. So beneath our feet. There's a full world going on right now. Where people are going every day. The Bible says that hell expands. The grave opens its mouth every day and it swallows people. Because there are so many who are dying in their sin. So many who are dying in their pride. So many who are dying in their self-righteousness. And I tell somebody today who God may have called, who God may have chosen, who God may have anointed. That if you are to warn people. You may have. You may be a popular pastor. You may be one with a mega church. You may be one with, with, with a great following. But you don't warn anybody. You care more about the people's pockets than you do their souls. Woe to you. Woe to you. I say woe to you and I'm praying that you turn away from your sins. You turn away from your greediness. You turn away from your lies. Because the truth of the matter is the end is near. The end is near. So I share Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18 for those who God has called, for those who God has chosen, for those who God has given a conviction in their heart, a pulling on their heart to warn the world. Warn the world. Let them know that the penalty of their sins is death. And I'm not talking about one just laying in their coffin. I'm not talking about just one where the, where, where the plug was pulled in the hospital. I'm talking about the second death. I'm talking about hell. I'm talking about Hades. That's what I'm talking about. So for those of you that are afraid to warn, for those of you that have been cowards, I'm warning you now. This is my warning to you. The blood is on your hands if you choose not to mourn. I want to share, I want to share James chapter 4, verse 4. James 4.4. 4. And this scripture is about those who want to be friends of the world. 
and yet they're an enemy of God. In James 4, 4, James said here, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. How many people today are so wor are, are, are more worried about how many followers they have? How many people today are more worried about how many clan claps they can get? How many people today are, are so concerned about hanging on to the culture? I told my wife last week or two weeks ago, you know, there was that scripture where Jesus talked about those who hang on to their lives really lose it. But those who are really who are willing to lose their lives, save it. So a lot of people today think, well, there's never been a gun tailed to my head for following Jesus. There's never been a machete held to my neck for following Jesus. I'm not threatened to be put on fire. I'm not threatened to be thrown in jail. So really, I have no reason. You know, that, that scripture doesn't really apply to me. But that is a lie from hell. That's a lie from hell. Because the truth of the matter is, and this is going to offend some folks. You, tr you hang on to the culture. Part of hanging on to your life is you trying to keep up with the culture. You want to keep up. You want to follow every single trend. You want to do what everybody else does. You want to think like the world thinks. You want to say what pleases the world. And you're afraid to say anything that may offend the world. Just as this message that I am delivering to you tonight. May I remind you, just as James said, you are an adulterer. I did a series uh, last year, a few months ago, really. It may have actually been earlier this year. I did a series on YouTube and it was called, Is the Body of Christ Committing Adultery? And I talked about those who want to live lukewarm lives six days a week, but then they want to be on fire for God on Sunday or on Saturday or on Wednesday, whatever day you go to church. They want to be on fire for God one day a week, not even a whole day. They want to be on fire for God for one hour. But the rest of the week, they're smoking weed. They're getting drunk on alcohol. They're having sex with whoever they want. They're watching whatever movie. They're listening to whatever music. They want to do whatever they want, saying, I know me. And little do they know that the more they know themselves, the less they know God. You think because you know you that it's okay for you to do certain things. You think because you don't feel a conviction. You think because you may not feel bad about getting drunk because you may not feel bad about having sex with someone because you don't feel bad about getting high. You think that's okay with God. You have become an enemy of God. Go ahead and become a friend of yourself. Go ahead and become a friend of the world. I'm going to say it right now. This feminist movement we see out here. And for all of the women watching this, I want to say I love you. God created you. He created you in, in, in his great and beautiful image. But we cannot feminize men. We cannot erase men. We cannot get rid of the masculinity. Do you not realize that is what Satan wants to do? He did it. He tried to do it in the Old Testament. And he tried to do it in the New Testament. If you don't believe me, I want to encourage you to read Exodus. And I want to encourage you to read the book of Luke. So in the Old Testament, read the book of Exodus. And in the New Testament, read the book of Luke. In Exodus, Pharaoh told his nurse midwives... He said the Hebrew Israelites, the Israelites, they're becoming too many. There's so many of them. He was threatened by them that if they become so many that they would overthrow Egypt. So what did he tell his nurse midwives to do? Kill every Hebrew boy. Every Hebrew boy that you see born, kill them. Kill them. Get rid of them. And Luke 
Luke is, is the book in the Gospels that gives us the backstory. He, they, they, he talks about Jesus' birth. He talks about John the Baptist's birth. He gives us a little bit of history. And you'll read in Luke that when the wise men came to Herod and they said they saw the star in the sky and that there was a great man, a king who was born, the savior of the world. Herod became threatened. So what did Herod do? Kill every boy under every boy that is two and under, under the age of two. Kill every boy. Herod did a slaughter. He did a slaughter to every baby. Pharaoh did a slaughter. He fed some of these babies to the alligators, to the crocodiles, trying to, trying to get rid of men. My point in saying that is, don't idolize your femininity. Don't idolize it. Yes, I'm all for women having equal opportunities to job. I'm all for women having equal opportunities to pay. I'm all for that. But what I'm not for is for women wanting to say, we don't need men. For women saying they, thinking they can do it all by themselves. That's out of order. That's not even how God created the world. That's out of order. But see, so many women watching this today. Because you want to hang on to the culture. Because you want to be a friend of the world. You say it's about my rights. It's about women's rights. I'm going to talk about another topic here. Abortion. In California and in Minnesota, there have been bills that have been introduced. Now, in Minnesota, I think it's been passed. I think. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to share a story with you here. And the reason why I think it's been passed, and I know in California this bill has been introduced. But basically, if a woman has an abortion and the baby is born alive, so whether the baby is crying or if the baby is silent when he comes out the when he or she comes out the womb, but they're alive, there's a pulse, there's a heartbeat. Guess what these bills say? And it just happened in Minnesota. Five babies in Minnesota who were born alive after an abortion were left there to die. There was no medical attention given to them. The medical staff in those hospitals. They left those five innocent babies to die. Now, I don't know about you all, but I felt like Jesus when I read that. And the reason why I say I felt like Jesus is because when I read that article, I was ready to flip over some tables. I was ready to, to flip over some tables. And I'm going to read the scripture to you later on here. About how angry Jesus was, how passionate he was about people repenting. He got so angry of what they did in his father's house. And I'll, we're going to talk about this here in a little bit. That he, he flipped over the tables. But anyways, these bills have been passed in California and in Minnesota. Where if a baby is born alive in, in the midst of an abortion and a baby is born alive. The medical staff can leave them on the table or they can leave them on the floor to die. To every born again believer, to every Christian who, who I, whom I have seen over these past few weeks, these past couple months, stand up for abortion and say that life doesn't begin in the womb. It begins at birth. Tell me. How this is of God. Tell me right now. See this is where culture has gotten us. When we follow culture. When we listen to culture. When we do what culture does. Instead of, instead of, staying, for, instead of staying for God's word. This is the result. And I know there are a lot of men and women of God. Who are afraid to talk about these things. I'm not. I'm sold out for Christ. I live for him. I've devoted my entire life to him. So go ahead and report me. Go ahead and block me. Go ahead and voice your disagreement. 
The truth of the matter is they're leaving babies there to die. At what point is it murder? You argue that there's no life in the womb. You came up with all these scenarios, all these reasons, because you're a friend of the world. And look at where it has gotten us today. They leave the babies on the floor and they leave the babies on the table to die. Somebody tell me right now, where is God in that? How is that Christ-like? When God told us that he knew us before we were in our mother's womb. You, if, if you don't believe in the Bible, if you don't believe in God's word, that's fine. Read science. Read some scientific article. Life begins at conception. But you mean to tell me here that because a, a woman doesn't want to care for a child or doesn't want to have the child, she doesn't want to have to deal with the consequences. Because a man doesn't want to be responsible for the action in which he partook in. You mean to tell me that when these babies are born alive, we cannot leave them there to die? The United States is going to face judgment. We are already facing judgment. And the wrath of God will soon be poured out. If you are a friend of the world, if you're a friend of culture, if you're hanging on to culture, you're hanging on to your life. If you're trying to keep up with every trend, if you're trying to do what the world is trying to do, you are a friend of the world. And I want to tell you right now, you're an enemy of God. James said you're an adulterer. You may say, Cameron, I'm single. How can I be an adulterer? You're cheating on God. You're not doing what God told you to do. You're not living for God. You're living for culture. You're living for the world. And I warn you again, repent, repent, and repent. I want to go to Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And Jesus here, it was a call to repentance. Jesus was calling people to repentance. You know, we hear many people say today, oh, Jesus didn't talk about hell. Oh, Jesus didn't talk too much about sin. That's not true at all. Anybody who is truly in their word will see that Jesus talked about hell more than any other prophet in the Bible. And Jesus talked about repentance more than any other person in the Bible. Because Jesus himself has seen heaven and Jesus himself has seen hell. But I want to go ahead and read it to you all here. It says about this time. Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. And he said, do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too. Unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they worst sinners in Jerusalem? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem is what he said? No. And I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. I've said before and I'll say it again. It doesn't matter how you die. It doesn't matter when you die. You can die by a car accident. You can die by a bullet. You can die in a natural disaster. You can die of natural causes. You can die of a pestilence of any virus. It doesn't matter how you die. If you have not repented, if you have not repented of your sins and turned to God. Jesus himself said you will perish. There will be so many people who will come that day. When they kneel before God. Those who knew him will say, Lord, Lord, Lord. Revelation tells us this. And those who refused him will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The way I died, it was, you, know, you know, it was pretty horrendous. The, 
the age at which I died or or I, nobody ever warned me, nobody ever told me. But the truth of the matter is that if you don't turn to God, if you don't repent of your sins, you will perish too. So I want to say again, and I'm going to say it three times again. Repent, repent, and repent. Luke chapter 13 verses 24 through 30 says, Work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom. For many will try to enter, but will fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading. Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you. And you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For you will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you will be thrown out. And people will come from all over the world. From east and west, north and south. To take their places in the kingdom of God. And note this. Some who seem least important now. Will be the greatest and some who are the greatest now will be least important then. To get into heaven, it is not easy. Salvation isn't as easy as I raise my hand at the altar call and I say, Lord, come into my heart. It's not as easy as taking communion on Sunday, but then doing whatever you want, drinking Hennessy, drinking tequila, getting drunk over all these things, getting high off of weed. Monday through Saturday, going to the club Saturday night. It's not that easy. It's hard work to get into the narrow door. Guys, it is a narrow door. Jesus said it will, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. It takes hard work. We must strive to get into heaven. Many people strive to get into college. They strive to get a certain position on the job. They strive to get a certain person. They strive to get a certain car, to get certain amounts of money. But they want to do the least to get into heaven. I warn you today, Jesus said it's hard work to enter that narrow door. Work hard. Don't be moved by culture. Don't live like culture. Don't do what culture does. Don't say what culture says. Live for me. Walk with me. Honor me. Obey me. Believe me. Love me. Think about this here. Jesus said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For you will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you will be thrown out. Imagine that person. I want you all to think about the last person who you know died. Who didn't live their lives for Christ. I don't care how many Facebook posts. How many, how many Instagram comments. I don't care how many people said rest in peace. But think about the last person who you know died. That did not live their life for Christ. Or who were lukewarm. Think about them. Here it is. They knelt before God. They are afraid. They see all this power. They, they see this man sitting on the throne who they would have, who they doubted before, who they didn't take seriously before. And he said, your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life. Away from me, for I do not know you. But before they went into hell. They saw a glimpse of heaven. They saw Abraham. They saw Isaac. They saw Jacob. 
They saw Noah. They saw Ezekiel. They saw Isaiah. They saw all the prophets. And just like that, they were in hell. They saw all this glory. And now they're in all this torment. They're in a place of darkness. That's how serious it is. That's how narrow this walk is. That's how difficult it is. You know, when you see gymnasts, they try to keep their balance on the beam. You sometimes see these, these men and women who try to walk on these, on these lines across skyscrapers and it's that thin. That's how hard it is to get into the kingdom of heaven. Every single day, my wife and I are repenting. Every single day, we're asking for forgiveness. We're asking God to forgive us of our sins. Every single day. Every day when we wake up and every night before we go to sleep, we are repenting. Because we know just like that, we can have our last breath. Just like that. I want to take you to Matthew chapter 10, verse, verses 32 through 33. And this was Jesus talking about those who are ashamed and unashamed. And he said, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my father in heaven. This goes far more than words. This is action. This is the posture of one's heart. You may, you know, we see many Facebook posts that say, if you love God, if you serve God, if you know that God is, is real, share it. Share this post if you know you're going to heaven. And there are many who have shared that post who have very well ended up in hell. Because, again, like I just said before, it is not that easy to get into heaven. It is not that simple. It is not that easy to enter and enter through those heavenly gates. What does it look like to acknowledge Jesus publicly? What does it look like to not be ashamed? It looks like being responsible. It looks like living holy. It's not cursing. It's, it's not getting drunk. It's not getting high. It's not smoking weed. It's not having sex outside of marriage. It's not sleeping with someone else who isn't your husband or your wife. It's not standing up for things of the world. It's not for it's not shedding innocent blood. I don't care what post you shared. I don't care what you say. It is about the posture of your heart and the life that you live. See, we want to rebuke those who do their absolute best every day to live holy. But we want to excuse sinfulness over and over again. When we see someone who is living in sin, when we see someone who is blaspheming God, we say, oh, it's just a mistake. Oh, don't judge them. Love them. But may I remind you that in Proverbs chapter 27, verse, verse 5, it says open rebuke is better than secret love. I'm rebuking you openly here. Open rebuke is better than secret love. You can't love someone secretly and expect them to know better. You can't love someone secretly and never warn them, never reprove them, never rebuke them and expect them to go to heaven. Proverbs says open rebuke is better than secret love. But there are so many people today who won't openly rebuke the culture, who won't openly rebuke a loved one, but they'll say, I'm not going to say anything. I dare won't judge them. But then let me also take you to Revelation chapter three, verse 19. It says correcting. It's talking about correcting out of love here. And it says Jesus actually said, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. 
So because I love you, I'm going to correct you out of love. Now, I can't, I'm not going to damn you, but I'm going to correct you. And although I know that I'm living holy, I, I cannot be holier than now that I, that I do not correct you, that I do not say, hey, you need to turn away from your wickedness. You need to turn away from your sinful ways. May I also share with you Psalm chapter 141 verse 5. And it says, let the godly strike me. It will be a kindness. If they correct me, it is soothing medicine. Don't let me refuse it. But I pray constantly against the wicked and their deeds. Here it is, the psalmist here. He said, let the godly strike me. Let the godly rebuke me. Let those who are living where God who are living for God correct me. Let those who are living holy lives correct me. For they love me, for they are kind to me. Because if they were not kind to me, if they did not love me, if they did not care about me, they would not correct me. It is a soothing medicine. But so many people don't want to hear this rebuke. So many people don't want to hear this message about hell. So many people don't want to hear men and women of God say, repent, repent, repent. Because at first it doesn't feel good. But if you end up in hell, you're going to remember that voice who said, repent, repent, repent. Turn away from your sins. Turn away from your wickedness. Turn away from the things of this world. That rebuke, that reproving, that correction, that those who do that, someone like me who is doing this because I love you. Anyone watching this right now, I do this because I love you. It's to help you. It's to possibly save you. The way you live. Shows a repentant heart. Luke chapter 3 verse 8 says. Prove by the way you live. That you have repented of your sins. And turn to God. Don't just say to each other. We're safe. For we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you. God can create children of Abraham. From these very stones. The stones worship God. The trees worship God. The flowers worship God. The grass we see worship God. The clouds worship God. So don't just say, oh, I'm a descendant of, I'm a descendant of Abraham. Don't just say, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a Catholic. Oh, I'm a Hebrew Israelite. Oh, I'm this, I'm that. So I'm safe. I got my ticket into heaven. No, 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 no. No, no you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. No. Because Jesus said in Luke chapter 5, verse 32, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know why they are sinners and need to repent. See, it's one thing to know. The key word in this scripture there is why they are sinners. Do you know why you are a sinner? See, some of us say, oh, I made a mistake. God knows my heart. Oh. I'm a sinner. God expected me to do so. So I'm just going to keep on doing it. No, 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 no. Do you know why you sinned? Do you know why you're in the place, in the predicament in which you are today? Do you know why? Some of you don't. Because some of you refu refuse correction. Some of you are so prideful that you won't repent. That you won't even confess to God right now of your wrong for doing. You won't confess to God right now of the things in which you have done that are not of him. But again, I say, repent, 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 repent. I want to go back to the rebuking real quick. Two verses here. Uh, two, chap two, two, two points here in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 17. 
This is where Jesus flipped the tables. And it says, when they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the, te the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have turned it into a den of thieves. How many churches today? How many synagogues today? How many temples today? Have been turned into a den of things. Have been turned into a den of thieves. Because they're so worried about how much money they make. They come up with so many ideas to make more money. They come up with so many ideas to fit in with culture. But the moment God says, I need you to give a message of repentance, I need, to give, I need you to deliver a rebuking message, they shy away. They coward. They get hush-hush. They say, that's not my calling. That's not what I was called to do. That's not who I am to be. Where are the Christians that will flip over tables in their hearts and that will say, enough is enough? Where are the John the Baptist today? Remember, John the Baptist rebuked Herod in Luke chapter 3, verse 19. It says, John also publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrongs he had done. Where are the John the Baptist today? Where are those who are willing to? Who are not afraid, who, who are not afraid of man, who are not afraid of culture, who are not afraid of the government. Who will flip over the tables and will say enough is enough. Because we see temples as these big buildings, but your body is a temple. And you've made your body a den of thieves. You're robbing yourself of joy. You're robbing yourself of hope. You're robbing yourself of peace. How many people today, and I'm on fire right now, because I'm passionate about your soul. How many people today, how many people do I have watching this message? Give me a thumbs up. Share the video. Heart it. Comment below. Who's going to flip over the tables in this season and say enough is enough? Who's going to raise up their voices and say we must live for God? Who's going to warn the nations? Who's going to go to Nineveh and warn the nations? Who's going to build the arks? Who's going to be like Paul and go to other places, go to other nations, go to other churches and say you're living in your sinfulness? Jesus said, what sorrow awaits you who are rich for you have only you have only your happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now? For a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now? For your laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors also praised the false prophets. How many leaders do we see who are praised today, but they won't give a real message? They won't rebuke. They won't correct. They won't say what's wrong. They will bow down to culture. They will come up with the hypest song. They will say the coolest things, wear the coolest clothes, have the fanciest houses, have the nicest parties. But the moment God says, the moment God says, give this message, give this warning, they become cowards. They want to be praised by the people. Jesus said, what sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds for their ancestors also praise false prophets. Jesus just gave you another example here of a false prophet. 
the culture today, the culture today is not a culture of God. Everything that we see going on today, the things that the wicked of this world stand up for. If the wicked of this world is praising someone who says they're of God, if they're praising someone who follows God, the truth of the matter is that person is most likely not speaking truth. They're not warning them. They're not correcting them. They're not saying Jesus is coming soon. My last few points here, and I'm going to just share three more scriptures here with you all. Just three more. It may not, it's not even going to be my own words. I'm just going to give you the word of God here. The first point is Rome. The first scripture I should say is Romans chapter 1 verses 21 through 32. And this is about God's anger at sin. So Paul said, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped Idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. And I'm just going to spell it out here for you. That's zodiac signs. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. I want to repeat that one more time. That should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, Envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21. I'm just reading the Bible here to you. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that this is in the Bible. This is the word of God. I'm going to read Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21. It says, when you follow the, the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Anyone living this sort of life, I'm going to list these things one more time for you. Anyone living in sexual immorality, anyone living in impurity, anyone living or, or, or doing what their lustful pleasures desire, anyone living in idolatry, anyone living in sorcery, anyone living in hostility, that's, that shows you have unforgiveness in your heart, anyone living in quarreling, anyone living in jealousy, anyone who, out, who has outbursts of anger, anyone who is selfishly 
truly ambitious, anyone who lives, lives for dissension, anyone who lives for division, anyone who is envious, who lives for drunkenness, anyone who loves to go to wild parties, which a lot today looks like a lot of raves and a lot of concerts and other sins like these, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Your salvation, your entry into the kingdom of heaven, belief is not the only thing you need to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said even the, even the demons know who God is. They believe him. They know he's real. It takes more than that. My last scripture here is Isaiah chapter 5 verses 20 through 23. And it's woes unto, woes unto the evil. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. That dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. What sorrow for those who are heroes at drinking wine and boast about all the alcohol they can hold. They take bribes to let the wicked go free. And they punish the innocent. All I share this message with you again. Because I love you. And because we are in the last days. And we're in a time where so many people are dying day after day, hour after hour. And the truth of the matter is. Because of the lives they lived, they're going to end up in hell. And I want to encourage each and every one of you here who hear my voice today, who is still watching this message, repent, repent, repent. You may hate me for this message. You may not like me for this message. You may say, He's so pessimistic. He's so negative. How is this message a message of love? I said it already earlier on. This is a correction out of love. But if you hate me, if you don't like me, if you... Whatever the case may be, however you may feel about me. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 verse 24, But I tell you the truth, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. No true prophet, no true man of God. No true woman of God is accepted in their own hometown. If you don't accept me, so be it. If you don't like me, so be it. I would rather you dislike what I said, but receive it and give your life to God. Then you go, okay, that was something and keep on going and do whatever you want to do. Repent, repent, and repent. I say this because I love you and because I someday want to inherit the kingdom of heaven with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I someday want to see you walking on that road, that street of gold. I want us to be laughing with one another. I want us to be Joyful, I want us to be worshiping God and dancing with one another in heaven, praising him on those streets of gold. But you will not get there if you do not repent. So I end this message to say, repent, repent, and repent.